I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hey, everybody, just one quick question before we get to this week's podcast. Are you enjoying these podcasts? If so, do me a favor. Go on to iTunes right now and give us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating or however many stars they have. I'm not even sure. Or write us a great review. It's the best way to promote theater to the rest of the web. Thanks so much for listening. Hello, World Wide Web. It's Ken Davenport here. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. I'm super excited to have today's guest on the podcast, not just because he has a great accent, uh, also because he's a great guy, and uh, most importantly, he's one of the smartest dramaturgical directors I've ever met and worked with. Uh, and he's here to give us his other side of the pond perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, director and writer, Mr. John Caird. Welcome, John. Hello. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So I'll tell you all a little secret. Before I have a guest on the podcast, I always do some research on them, even when I know them very, very well. And of course, one of my first stops is their Wikipedia page. <laughs> and John Caird's Wikipedia page is so epic and chock full of these incredible credits. I swear they could break it up into chapters and sell it as a memoir. I mean, this, <laughs> this thing is long and unbelievably awesome. He's been directing plays and musicals and operas all over the world, including a long stint at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Royal National Theatre, the Royal Dramatic Theatre. So many royals, John. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, don't, I get on very well with the royals. <laughs> I, I keep them in plays and musicals. <laughs> uh, of course, here stateside produced the epic and historic production of The Life and Adventures of Nicholas, Nicholas Nickleby. Jane Eyre Stanley and is currently represented off-Broadway with the brand new production of Daddy Longlegs, of which he is also the book writer and, of course, I am the producer. Uh, and am I leaving anything out? Well, oh. Les Mis is running on Broadway. Right, yeah. right. There's that little credit, <laughs> uh, that show that no one's ever heard of. John co-directed the semi-successful show uh, that was the original company of Les Miserables. So, John. Yes. How did this all begin well, for you? I, it, it all be I don't know. It depends where you want to start. Um, I heard a rumor you were an actor. I was an actor. I trained as an actor at the Old Vic School in Bristol. Um, one of my classmates was Jeremy Irons, same year as me. So that dates me. You see. Um, he's wearing well. Yeah, I trained as an actor. I, I worked as an actor for a couple of years. And I got... I didn't like it. I didn't like acting, really. I didn't like pretending to be other people for money. <laughs> I knew almost as soon as I got to drama school that I wanted to be a director. So it was just a matter of sort of going through the motions of being an actor. But I, I, I hated acting so much that I, I just stopped doing it. And instead I went into the technical side of theatre, just to learn the trade. And I, I was a flyman in the West End. I was a crewman in the West End. I, I did two years in stage management at the Northcott Theatre in Exeter, a little rep theatre in England, which was being run by a wonderful woman director, Jane Hull, one of the first successful female directors in, in the UK. And I really learned my trade there, just watching her directing. It's a fantastic uh, training for a director to be on the book in rehearsal because you, you, you have to give all the cues, you, have, you get the rhythm of the show, you learn the play, you learn what the actors are like. You know, you, you just observe everything and soak everything up like a piece of blotting paper. I did that for two years and then I started directing. And what is it about directing that attracted you to it? I think um, there was a sort of me-shaped hole in, in the, all the theatre companies I went into because I was brought up in, in university towns. All that. My father was a, was a professor at Oxford, professor of theology, and my mother was a teacher of English. So I came from a highly intellectual background. So by the time I was about 14 or 15, I, un I understood all the, the texts that I was expected to act or work on. And the theatre isn't a particularly intellectual place. It's full of highly talented, gifted, clever people. But literacy isn't necessarily their t top skill. So I... I just found myself constantly being appealed to, you know, please explain this. What does this line mean? What's Shakespeare talking about here? What's Johnson on about in this scene? And I think it's one of those things that ha it's part partly one's ego is pleased, you know, one's ego is stroked by that. But 
in any job, I think the feeling of being necessary is a very important part of your success in the job. Feeling needed, f feeling that what you're doing is, is useful to the people around you. And I think my directing skill largely grew from that. And I think it's sti I'm still doing exactly the same thing now. I, I, I direct plays for companies when, when it would be useful for me to do so. <laughs> So you're stage managing, and you you decide I want to be a director. How do you work yourself up from that? How do you climb through the ranks? I started ranks? doing little sort of lunchtime shows with the actors I was working with, especially the junior actors who weren't doing much in the plays. You know, they had only a few small lines, or and so we we would get together and do do readings or little productions that we did in lunchtimes or late nights. And uh, I just got noticed, I suppose, by one or two of my older directorial colleagues. They thought I was showing some talent. I can't imagine why. Um, and I saw, I landed a job as an associate director in a, in a fledgling theatre company in Manchester in northern England. And from there I, I just grew. Directing is one of those jobs that you can't learn to do in college. It, you, you have to do it. it. Because it's basically an artisan job. It's like cabinet making or, or stone masonry. You're building things out of actors and scenery and sound and light. And it's something where you're really using your mind and your hands, your building skills all at the same time. And you can't do that in theory. You have to do it in practice in order to understand how to get better at it. It's the most important thing. The book I wrote called Theatre Craft, that's one of the reasons that that book has that title, Theatre Craft. It's... It's the craft of making plays, and it's just the same as making a beautiful piece of furniture. And you were an associate for a few years before you started working on your own professional. Do you think the... Oh, no, I started directing my own productions right away. Like at the age of 23 or 4, I was doing my own shows. Do you think it's important that people are associates for a little while or do you think they should jump out on their own? Should I it? think it's great to be an assistant director if you're, if you're assisting somebody good. There are lots of ways into being directors. A lot of actors become good directors and it's the same thing. They sit in rehearsal. They work with a lot of different directors. They learn the good things and the bad things about directors. Some of the best directors in the world were, were actors for a long time, you know, for 10, 15 years, sort of learning their trade in the rehearsal room. There isn't a single route to being, to being a director. I think young directors can get sidetracked by assisting too much. If you assist for years and years and years, you sort of become a career assistant or a career associate. You have to take the jump and direct something of your own. What was that first big show for you where you were like, oof, this, well, I've, I, I've I think, hit it now? I think I, I was so full of hubris as a young director. I, I arrived at this little theatre company in Manchester. My artistic director, my boss, who's still a very close friend, Paul Clement, he said, well, what do you want to direct? I said, I want to direct Shakespeare. I want to direct Twelfth Night. He said, oh, my God, how, where are we going to get all the actors? He said, well, we'll find them. We'll do it somehow. And I did the most awful production of Twelfth Night you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I was so full of myself. And then, but I did lots of small plays by Osborne, Beckett, Chris Bond. I did Chris Bond's wonderful play, Sweeney Todd, before it ever became a musical. I wrote the music for Chris Bond's Sweeney Todd, like that's, three years before Stephen Sondheim even read it. That's missing from the Wikipedia page, that, that credit right there. We're going to add Is that it? in later. Oh, yeah. I didn't oh, right. see that. Do you think there's a... What's the big difference between directing a play versus directing a musical, speaking of? Sweeney or speak you did song and dance early. Yeah, right? I did song and dance. Yeah. Andrew Lloyd Webber's strange double bill. Cameron McIntosh produced that for Andrew Lloyd Webber and working with those two amazing egos was a remarkable experience. They're both I love them both. I'm very fond of them both, but both of them in the same room at the same time was always a bit of a task. It was a show called Song and Dance. It had a single woman singing the first half, and then a dance troupe dancing the second half. And on the final preview, before we opened, Andrew and Cameron came to me and said, it should be called Dance and Song, because the dance should be first, because people are just going to leave in the intermission. 
I said, you can't call it dancer song. That's not a thing. <laughs> so I said, please, can we just, just leave it as it is? It would be devastating to change this. <sighs> I'm really worried about it. But it was just sort of last minute jitters by, by producers. About. That's what they were worried about. They were, <laughs> yeah, they were just worried that people were going to leave the theatre, that it was going to be boring and that we should do the exciting half first. I said, that's not the right way to think about it. And you really can't call it dancer song. Just shows that even the top people can get extremely nervous at the last moment. You, what I find very interesting about your career is you co-directed a number of times, of course, uh, with Trevor Nunn, uh, with Scott Schwartz on yeah. Jane Eyre. And a lot of people might say, co-direct, forget it. This is like having co-CEOs or co-captains of a ship. Why have you done it so many times and what appeals to you about it? I didn't start doing it until Trevor and I decided to do it on a Shakespeare play and then on Nicholas Nickleby. The reason for doing it is when you have a piece that is so massive, so difficult, so full of dramaturgical problems, like when you're doing a big adaptation of a novel or whatever, that one person is just going to get horribly swamped by the responsibility and the size of cast. When you're adapting something from the raw, like we did with, with Les Miserables, you know, we, we were, our credit on Les Miserables, Trevor and me, is adapted and directed by. Well, adapted and directed by basically meant that we rewrote Alan Bublil's original book in rehearsal, mostly. So it was, it was a huge task. It couldn't, couldn't have been done by one person. And that's because the, the dramaturgical skills that you bring to bear are very different mentally from the directorial skills. So it's great to have somebody spelling you off day by day, week by week, so that if one person gets exhausted working on a particular scene or working on, on the dramaturgy of a whole act, the other person can take over. So it's not that one person does all the dramaturgy no, and one person not at all. staging. It's... Not at all. It's a partnership. And of course, with, with the big musicals, you asked just now, what's the difference between doing a musical and doing a play? It's all about collaboration. Most plays, even today, are written by dead authors. I mean, the, the plays that you do, that doesn't sound right. How can somebody write a play if they're dead? Um, the author is, is deceased when you do the play, and therefore there's no collaboration about it. The text is the text. You, but you also have great freedom. You can do what you want with it, more or less. But there's nobody to discuss with it. You have a designer, a lighting designer, but you're it. You're the person. You have a leading actor, but you're the person who's making all the decisions when you're directing a play. With a musical, there's a composer, a lyricist, a book writer, a musical director, lighting designer, sound designer, choreographer. I mean, it's an extraordinary hodgepodge of of um, artistic influence going on all around you. So you're collaborating anyway in, in a very vivacious way with all the people around you. Having a co-director actually makes that easy because you can, the two of you can handle, as long as you're getting on well together, the two of you can handle everything. And it has to be done with a lot of humour. And Trevor and I always used to say to our cast, if we say anything to contradict one another, then we're both right. <laughs> <laughs> and did that happen often? Well, it happened occasionally, you know, but, but we said, look, don't even try to drive a wedge between us. You know, if Trevor says something that contradicts what John said a day before, tell us that's what happened. Just say, well, that's not what Trevor said, and we'll talk about it, we'll, we'll work it out. But it, it actually helps to create a lot of lively debate in rehearsal because you have all your arguments out, out in the open. You know, you, see, you, you, you can't have a lot of ego involved in it. You've got to be a, the sort of director who doesn't get damaged by people disagreeing with, with them. And of course, the, you know, some directors are very paranoid about getting ideas from other people in the rehearsal room. It's, it's, it's quite a problem, actually, I think, for, especially in musical theatre, which is such a highly pressurised job. I wish directors weren't like that, but you hear horror stories about directors who just can't take contradiction from anybody and it sort of physically hurts them. 
and it's just the they're just going into rehearsal with the wrong mental attitude. You know, if if they're strong, if their ideas are good, they'll survive the debate of the rehearsal room. And if an idea is bad, it ought to be kicked out. It doesn't matter who kicks it out. If it's good, it'll survive. You know, you'll cut you'll you'll cut it one day and you'll put it back two days later because it was too good an idea not to be on the show. How much of a director's job do you think is dramaturgy? I think it's the majority of what a director should do. Should up and coming directors be studying that part of They certainly should. They they should study the history of drama, they should study the great plays. Of course, one's dramaturgical skills are much more required in new work than old work. There's no point in having dramaturgical skill on Oklahoma because the estates of Rogers and Hammerstein won't let you change your words, so there's no point in you going to them and saying, wouldn't it be a better idea if the final song was different? They're they're not going to let you do it. You can dream on, even though it ought to be different. (laughs) There you go. Um, I'm going to get Ted Shaper on a podcast. It's coming up. We'll ask him that question. No, I was using that as a a facetious example. Um, But... So in, in a new work, you absolutely, your, your, your dramaturgical skills are very important. And it, it's interesting, I look at my own career, and I'm not the only director that this has happened to. When I work on a new musical, invariably, in the process of working on the show, I've become a co-author. And it's, it's not because I want to muscle in on other people's territory in an arbitrary way. It's because, rather like in film when a director takes on a screenplay, in film, the director almost automatically becomes authorial because in the end, the film story is, is being told in pictures. And it, you can't do that on, write that on a screenplay. In a musical, there are so many other collaborators going on. There is so much to be managed in artistic terms that part of one's management of it is an intervention, is an artist, becomes an artistic intervention. And after you've worked on a, on a new musical for three or four months, you start looking at it and you think, just a minute, this is my work now. I've, I've more or less completely redefined this. So it would be dishonest of everybody not to fess up to the fact that this now has a different authorial dimension. There comes a point in the development of anything any new musical, when as a director you look at the piece in development you say, okay, what would I feel if this piece now went on and was a huge success and got done in multiple productions all around the world, exactly as it is with all my work still in it, even if it's directed in a completely different way how would I feel if my name wasn't on it? It would be wrong. It, w- it wouldn't. Credits in everything by the very nature of the word credit credits should tell the truth about who did what. And sometimes they don't. And it's a shame when they don't. And whenever a, whenever a musical theatre team starts assessing who has done what in the last few weeks before rehearsals start, they should take a deep breath sometimes and say, actually, you know what? These credits are not telling the truth. We need to include this man, this woman, in some way that because it, it's not fair that the extraordinary thing they've done for this show is invisible, in perpetuity. It's not fair. It's not right. I want to talk about Nicholas Nickleby a bit. Okay. How long is it? Tell us how long it is, for those of us who don't know, the listeners out there. The play was eight and a half hours long. The first half was four hours. The second half was four and a half hours. So when it ran at the Plymouth here, it started at two, I think. It ran from two till six, the first half. There was a meal break. The Schubert's sold lunch boxes in the, inter- in the intermission. And then, I mean, there were also in- intermissions in, in that time. And then the second half ran for four and a half, so it finished at sort of 11.30, 11.40 at night. And this was in 1986, yep. I believe. So did you get a lot of resistance? No, this was 1981. Oh, 81? Yeah. So it was in 1981. Yeah. What kind of resistance did you get to that length? Did people say, you're absolutely crazy, this is impossible, there's oh, no yeah. way we can do this? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story. I was, I was standing outside the stage door of the Plymouth Theatre, and the Bernie and Jerry, the Schubert producers, had put a big perspex glass wall 
instead of the dock door, so that people passing by could see the set being built. So it became a sort of window on the set being built, it was deemed to be very interesting. And I was standing there one day, two or three days after I'd arrived from England, and there were two women looking through the, the glass window, and they were just sort of staring at it. And then a friend of theirs rolled up suddenly along the sidewalk and stopped and said, what's going on here? What's going on? And one of the women who'd been there said, I tell you what's going on. It's apparently, it's the Royal Shakespeare Association. And it's a play called The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. And apparently, it's eight and a half hours long. She said, you know what I think? I think these guys are going to be telling us a whole lot about Nicholas Nickleby. We do not need to know. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this is all a huge mistake. <laughs> and obviously it was not a huge mistake. It, but... it was not a huge mistake. One of the amazing things, of course, was it was $100 a ticket, which was, if you, if you are buying theatre by the pound, there's a reasonable deal at, at eight and a half hours. But the Schuberts and the Niederlanders who were co-producing it got into terrible trouble for that. A hundred dollars a ticket was regarded as an insult, a terrible insult. But there you go. Mm -hmm. Do you think it could work today? If you did the show again? Yeah, if you, hey, we want to do this show, it's called The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby, it's eight and a half hours long. Do you think someone think, on Broadway would do it today? I think it could be done, yes. I mean, the, was it the Kentucky Cycle that was done? That was very long. Mm -hmm. I think it could be if it was good enough. I, I think it, at the time we did it, it was an extraordinary moment. I mean, it, it wasn't successful immediately in England. It caught on because audiences adored it so much and it became like a sort of national treasure. And I think in New York, nobody had ever seen anything like it. So there was a kind of terrific frisson about people going to see it. It was an amazing thing to invest a whole day in watching a theatre piece. And of course it was because it was all English actors, it was the Royal Shakespeare Company, it was it was a type of acting that people hadn't seen a lot of before. Um, and it was an amazingly powerful story. You know, the beginning of the 80s it was all about politics had gone very greedy. Everybody was completely taken with the new capitalism, you know, you could make a fast buck anywhere, and you could ride roughshod over anybody. But this was preaching a completely different ethic. You know, it was really a socialist piece. It was Dickens, after all. You know, he's, the story that he was selling us was to do with compassion and love and fellow feeling. And I, I, that rang a lot of bells at that time, both in England and here. You know, people really got it. So speaking of England and here and those audiences, what do you think the major differences are between the British audience and the American audience? I don't think there's a huge difference between Britain and America. I think there's a big difference between London and New York. But I, I mean, if you go to a, a little rep theatre company in Chicago, it's very similar to going to one in Bristol or Manchester. You know, it's, theatre's the same everywhere, really. The industry that is the West End and the industry that is Broadway are, are quite different, I think. They have a different temperature. But those industries are not representative of the national theatre, I don't think, in, on either side of the pond. I suppose the great difference between London and New York is that London is still, is still a town of plays and playwrights. People are hungry for the play with the new idea, the play with the new story, um, because our theatrical history is so based in great literary masterpieces from Shakespeare onwards. And plays in England are sort of part of the national intellectual debate. If Stom Tom Stoppard or David Hare write something, you go to, to hear what Tom Stoppard or David Hare are thinking these days. And Musicals, on the other hand, are sort of the cherry on the trifle in England. They are, sometimes they're brought in from America, sometimes they're homegrown. But they have quite a different audience, actually, musicals. 
in England. There's a sort of class system, if you like, between plays and musicals, between opera and musicals in, in England. New York, on the other hand, is the home of musicals. If you look at the we look in variety at the roster of shows at any one time. Three quarters of the shows, or more, are musicals. Sometimes, almost all of them, all but five or six shows are musicals. And it's actually quite difficult to get a good new play on Broadway. You're more likely to see a good new play in Chicago than you will in, in New York. And it's what makes New York such a, or Broadway, such a, a vibrant culture, because it it, it knows what it wants to concentrate on. It is the world capital of musical theatre. This is where you bring a musical to test it out and see whether it's any good. Whereas in the West End, the West End is where you, you put your play up to see whether the, the general public will approve of it or want to think about it. So speaking of bringing a musical here to see if it will if it will work, that's of course what happened with Les Mis. Let's talk a little bit about the origins of that. So, when did you first take a look at the material? Did you see the French? No, I never. No, no, none of us saw the French, except for the sound designer and Andrew Bruce, who who actually designed the sound for us at the Palais des Sports in 1980. Claude Michel and Alain were doing Les Mis in Paris at the same time we were doing Nicholas Nickleby in London um, in 1980. I first listened to the tapes while I was driving my car all the way through England. Down, I, I just put on a play in Newcastle on Tyne and I was driving 250 miles to London and I listened to it four times in the car on the way down. By the time I, I'd arrived in London I'd completely fallen in love with the score. It was in French. And even my schoolboy French was enough to detect what a brilliant, brilliant theatrical score it was. And Trevor Nunn and I took it on. And Cameron Mackintosh asked us to look at it, and we took it on. It was very much on the heels of Nicholas Nickleby. <clears throat> it was because of our success in adapting a huge novel that it was only four years later that we were, three years actually, we were started to work on on the Mills. And did you know from the get-go that it was something special when you got in the rehearsal room, or was it difficult? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. we knew it was very, very special. Um, of course, what we didn't know was that it would be a success. One can never know that. Nobody could have known that it would, have, that it would still be running 30 years later. You know, that's a ridiculous thought. But it, we certainly knew we were working on something that we thought was extraordinarily special. Which was why, when it got such horrible reviews, we were quite, you know, bewildered and injured for a moment. Um, it's unfathomable. I'm sure a lot of people <coughs> just went, "What? Les Mis got bad reviews?" Oh, How just shocking! Not just bad reviews, poisonously bad reviews. It was a very interesting moment because we did it at the Royal Shakespeare Company. That was one of the stipulations that my colleague Trevor Nunn had with Cameron Mackintosh. When Cameron brought it to us, Trevor said, I'll do this if we can do it at the RSC because we need the safety of a not-for-profit company to develop something this mighty, to really work on the dramaturgy, to get it right. But there was at that time, and there still is in England, a huge critical snobbery about musicals. Most English critics like musicals if they're fluffy, comedic, silly, dancey. You know, the period musical comedies. They, they pretend they love them. But anything that is written in a modern idiom with a rock score that tries to tell a serious story, they automatically sense is pretentious. You can't be saying something politically serious from the stage if you've got a drum kit in the pit. It just doesn't work for them. And, <laughs> and it, it, of course, you know, it's the old snobbery of opera versus musical theatre. But what we felt foul of, I think, more than anything else, was that we were the Royal Shakespeare Company. We were supposed to be doing Shakespeare. So the posh critics objected to the show on the basis that we were trivialising a great work of literature by turning it into a silly musical. And they all pretended that they read Les Miserables in the original French at least once a year, and that it was their favourite bedside book. I'm sure none of them had ever read it. 
But the tabloid papers, the popular papers, objected to it for the opposite reason, that it was too serious and too dull and, and too gloomy and doomy. And they made sort of jokes about the title and how miserable the whole thing was. So we got hit from both sides. Nobody liked it. <laughs> Except the audience. And of course the audience completely adored it. From day one? From day one. The word of mouth was unbelievable. It sold out at the Barbican Theatre like in, like in a week. So I mean it, it, was, it was literally a popular success. And then once it became a popular success, about a week after we opened, a great review came in, and then another, and then another, and then. By the time we got to Broadway, of course, people, people had got it. You know that a bad review wasn't going to stop us, so you might as well join the join the ride. <laughs> Do you hear the people saying for sure? Might as well join that join yeah. that group. Yeah. So you worked obviously with Cameron and a number of other great producers mm-hmm. out there. What? Do you like your relationship to be with producers? What characteristics do you look for in a producer that you want to work with? It's a very difficult relationship, or it can be a difficult relationship, the producer-director relationship. Because from the producer's point of view, it's impossible to raise millions of dollars or millions of pounds for something and not be allowed to have a view about what's going on. It, it would be preposterous to lock the door on the producer and say, well, you just have to give us the money and you're not allowed to, to have an opinion about what we're doing. And in fact, one welcomes the producer's view because it's, it's wonderful to have an outside eye on things. And most good producers have got a good sense of popular taste. That's what makes them good producers. So one likes to have those conversations. Where it can go wrong, I think, is if the producer has all the authority and the director only a small amount of authority. So that if, if the producer comes in and demands changes, I think that can be troublesome, especially if it's with a young director who's very grateful to be doing the job and so very anxious to please the producer. And I think what Cameron often says is, he'll come and see a run, he'll, he'll say, I hate that, that seems wrong. That seems... And he, he, he might make a suggestion about how it should be fixed, and often his comment about the fact that it's wrong is absolutely bang on, it's absolutely right. But his solution is not the right solution to the problem. And so he'll, he'll end up by saying, look, all I know is it's not working. I let you decide how to fix it. I'm not going to tell you how to fix it, but you have to fix it. And I think that's, that's dead right. You know, just the, the feeling you need to get from your producer is when something's just not working, when it's w- way too long, when it's boring, when a particular performer is not scoring a bullseye. And it's great to hear that because you, you can then... Sometimes it's producerial help is not useful, but then you have to, you know, you talk about it, you have a conversation, you, you explain why opinions differ. And if things are, if the relationship between director and producer is bad, then all sorts of horrible things start to happen because very often they can't actually act out their bad relationship against each other. The bad re- relationship gets deflected into other relationships. And it's sort of axiomatic that when a show is in trouble, there are rows all over the place, and always the wrong person is fired. You know, if the costumes are horrible, the lighting designer gets fired. If, if the score is terrible, you hire a new lyricist. <laughs> you know, it's, it's axiomatic that, that when things break down at the highest level, bad decision-making starts filtering down through everybody. So it's very, very important that the producer and the director keep really tight together, you know, that they show a united front. That's really, really important. Even when there might be quite deep disagreements, it's important that the two captains of the ship or the co-captains of the ship are working in in tandem. So you've worked on some of these most massive productions Broadway in the world. I see Nicholas Nickleby, Les Mis, and now you're working off Broadway in a in my theater. Yeah. Uh, in a show that I'm producing that you co-wrote 
called Daddy Long Legs, which has two people. Yeah. And one little unit set, and it's the sweetest, most beautiful, intimate story that I've seen on a musical stage. What attracted to you to this very small, tiny story compared? You do operas all over the world. Yeah. Why this and why so? Well, it, I love the small as well as the big. I mean, I've done shows in Las Vegas, you know, and, and huge operas with massive cast. Right, you did Siegfried and Roy. I did Siegfried and Roy. That only had two people in it as well, except, <laughs> except they were and surrounded by 400 other people and tigers. And and tigers. Well. Um, but it's the smallness of it that is a, that's attractive. You know, in the end, you don't need a lot of stuff to do good theatre. One man in a room with a candle beside him, lighting the space, is enough for great storytelling to happen, as long as he's a great storyteller. Sometimes small spaces, intimate relationships between performers, the feeling that you can reach out your hand and touch what's happening on stage can make for the most powerful feeling in the theatre. When I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company, I was there for 13 years, and I would go from doing huge Shakespeare productions in the main house to doing tiny little new plays with only three or four people in the other place theatre, which seated 120 people. And I, I loved both of them. Doing both feeds both. It stops you getting complacent about the work that you do. But I think in the end, if I had to choose, I would choose small scale over big scale. Because in the end, with big scale, especially with opera, it's what my friend Denny Sayers calls human flower arranging. <laughs> you know, people are moving around the stage for no very good motivational reason. They're just moving around because it keeps it more interesting. Whereas on the small scale, absolutely everything that every character is doing they're moving for an important reason they're saying what they're saying for an important reason and what that does to the audience is it helps the audience conspire with the performers to help tell the story you can really say to your actors in a, when they're in a small space listen to the audience trust, trust who they are tonight change your performance a bit to accommodate what you're getting back from them. Because they're a yard away from you. You know, you can see the whites of their eyes. And that's very exciting. That's, that's what, what the origin of theatre is all about. So my last question, John, my genie question, we call it here, I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin <laughs> has come to visit you and to thank you for your incredible gifts to the theatre and say, you know what, John, for your contributions, we're going to grant you one wish, just one. I want you to think about what is the one thing that drives you so crazy <laughs> about Broadway? Makes you angry, keeps you up at night. Ah, I wish they would change that, and this genie will wish it away for you. What's the one thing that you'd want this genie to change? I think the genie should build another 40 Broadway theatres. <laughs> Because that's always the problem there. There's wonderful shows waiting to happen. There's millions of people wanting to see shows. And there's a tiny theatre stock. You need more theatres. Go build them. And when you build them, Jeannie, please build theatres with three or four stories of rehearsal rooms on top of them. So that people don't have to scrabble around looking for rehearsal rooms. And when you build the rehearsal rooms, put windows in them, windows that open, so that the actors, in their little brief time in the rehearsal room, when they're not stuck in the dark, they can actually look out of the window and see life going by and breathe real air. <laughs> there are so many theatres, new theatres built all around the world where the stupid architects have put the rehearsal rooms underground, thank you very much, or even overground with no windows. It's bizarre. I want to go to these theatre architects and say, my theatre colleagues and I have decided that you will spend the rest of your life designing your buildings in a room without windows or natural air. You'll like that, won't you? <laughs> anyway, Jeannie, build more theatres. 
The Go for it. The ultimate payback prison for the architect in the room with no windows. I love it. Uh, big thanks to John Kerry for sharing his wisdom and his accent with us today. Uh, do go see Daddy Long Legs. It is beautiful. And look, anything that could get the director of Nicholas Nickleby and Les Mis and Siegfried and Roy to want to spend his time working on this show and writing this show, you know it's a unique and beautiful experience. So go see it. Thanks again, John. Thanks again, all Thank of you. you. Can. We'll see you Thank next you. time. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody, this podcast is over, so now you know what to do. Go on to iTunes, give us a great rating. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. I'm going to be a producer. Look out, bro.